Wszystko zaczęło się od króla Jagiełły. Mała Łodzia stała się miastem, które w XIX wieku rozwijało się najszybciej na świecie. W ciągu zaledwie 60 lat od powstania pierwszej manufaktury powstaje przemysłowa, wielonarodowościowa metropolia. Jednak wiatry historii nie zawsze jej sprzyjały. To, co zniszczył los, odbudowują łodzianie. Nasza Łódź. Miasto wielkich szans. Od 600 lat w sercu Polski i Europy. Jesteśmy Polakami. Jesteśmy niezwykłym społeczeństwem. Zawsze w obliczu wielkiego wyzwania potrafimy się mobilizować. Potrafimy stawić czoła wielkim wyzwaniom. Bo nie potrafimy stać obojętnie. Bo obchodzi nas bezpieczeństwo i przyszłość naszych dzieci. Bo wierzymy, że nadzieja zwycięża apatię, lęk i strach. Bo mimo wszelkich przeciwności nigdy się nie poddajemy. Potrafimy ciężko pracować, wspierać się i działać razem. Bo zależy nam na naszej ojczyźnie, naszym osiedlu, naszej ulicy. Bo chcemy naszych niezbywalnych praw i wolności. Bo nie oddamy naszych marzeń. Nadchodzi punkt zwrotny. Ladies and gentlemen, I have promised that we will use different uh, definitions of the turning uh, point, uh, which is contained in the name of the 10th edition of the Freedom Games. Now we will have a panel uh, on the turning point for the future of Europe. I would like to invite to the stage our distinguished guest, the Thomas Hendrik Ilves. Uh, Estonian politician, diplomat, president of Estonia between 2006-2016. Mark Leonard, UK political scientist. Bruno Massaes, a politician, former secretary of state for European affairs in Portugal. And Natalie Tocci, an Italian political scientist, international relations expert. This panel will be uh, facilitated by Piotr Buras, who is a political scientist and a journalist. Andrew, for me to be here and uh, to welcome you very warmly on behalf of the Euro European Council on Foreign Relations um, and Institutions I'm representing and which has a pleasure to be a partner institution of uh, the Freedom Games this year. And um, uh, it has been already said that we will be talking about the turning point, turning point for Europe. There are various notions circulating in the intellectual, international debate. There is also a notion of Zeitenwende. Zeitenwende is uh, probably the most, uh, the best known uh, notion of a turning point um, coined by Olaf Scholz, as, as uh, many of you know very well, but it's uh, pro probably a little bit less known that there is also another version of, of Zeitenwende, change in times, um, which was coined by Xi Jinping, um, who famously said that we are living, that we were experiencing changes unseen in a century to describe the developments shaping the world of our time. And as recently as in March, when Putin and um, she met in Moscow, she said, right now there are changes, the likes of which we have not seen for 100 years, and we are the ones driving these changes together. And in this panel, we want indeed to talk about the global Zeitenwende, or about the nature of those changes unseen in a century. 
which are likely to reshape the global order. And we will talk about shifting tectonic plates in, in national relations. We will talk about the quest for supremacy between China and the US, about the end of the post-Western world, uh, and um, or maybe the beginning of the post-Western world, actually, the end of the, of the West, Western-led uh, world order. And uh, also, of course, about the question of whether we have a new global order or perhaps a new global disorder. And lastly, but certainly not least importantly, we will talk about what this all means for Europe, what is the turning point in the European history. And please let me once again welcome and introduce a great panel, starting with Thomas Hendrik Ilves, former president of Estonia, then Mark Leonard, my boss, the director of the European Council of Foreign Relations, and author of a book, uh, The Age of Unpeace, which has been uh, very recently translated onto Polish and published in Polish. Bruno Basaj, um, former Portuguese Minister for Europe, and currently, among others, um, European Affairs Correspondent of the New Statesman, also author of numerous books on, on Eurasia and, and world order. And lastly, uh, Natalie Tocci, Director of uh, Institute for International Affairs in Rome, and uh, also a book on, uh, author of, of a book recently published on, on Green Europe. Um, once again, very well welcome. And I would like to start with uh, President Ilves uh, with, a, with a question referring to what's happening, um, of course, at our eastern border. Because I think for us in, in Poland, in, in Estonia, in our region, it's um, quite obvious that um, the war in Ukraine is the most significant watershed moment after 1989. It's indeed a turning point or, or change unseen in, in a century. But, Mr. President, is it also a game changer on a global scale? Is, it, is this war bringing about a, a Titan vendor in international relations at large? Well, thank you. Jean uh, Kua, and it's great to be back in Poland, one of my favorite places. Um, well, I don't know if I can extend it to the entire world. Certainly, I would say to the, the West or the transatlantic world, we have seen, I think, the most dramatic changes since, um, uh, since beginning with the 24th of February. Whether it's a game changer, even within Europe itself, I, however, I think remains to be seen whether something is be new is being born or we return to the post-Cold War stagnation of outdated power relations in Europe, uh, I don't know. Um, basically, what is notable is that after 30 years of dismissing Central and Eastern Europe, Western Europe has grudgingly admitted that Russia is not a peace-loving kumbaya la-la land that uh, is a gold mine for anyone who goes Regard there, regardless of whether it's legal or not. Um, and we also see that we in uh, Central and Eastern Europe are not the ignorant primitives that uh, we saw in what I guess Natalie will talk about uh, later, the uh, famous, infamous article by Habermas and Derrida 20 years ago called The Rebirth of Europe, which claimed that uh, demonstrations against the Iraqi war were a, a sign of a new foreign policy in Europe. <clears throat> um, but it's, um, but it's, um, it's a slow change. I mean, it's a year and a half, but let us recall that as late as February, this year's February at the Munich Security Conference, Emmanuel Macron, um, Emmanuel Lemagne, I would call him, uh, called East Europeans warmongers. Um, and what, if you look back just in the last 20 years, uh, the history of how uh, Central and Eastern Europe was viewed in Western Europe, um, you can just list, I mean, you can say uh, 
2007, NATO did not believe that there was a DDoS attack on my country. Um, we claimed that we were just being Russophobic. Sarkozy in Georgia in 2008 um, didn't want to meet with little East Europeans, but did claim that um, after after a new peace deal, had claimed that um, that uh, we have to uh, go back to the partnership and cooperation agreement, and common sense had prevailed. We saw the Obama reset a year after, uh, or less than a year after the invasion of Georgia in 2008. Nord Stream 2 was signed a year after the invasion and occupation of Crimea. Um, I especially like the uh, leak that the final minute of the proposed um, Merkel-Putin summit, in, uh, with, rather Merkel-Macron summit with Putin in 2021, which Western, Eastern European found, uh, Europeans found out only the day before the council. So anyway, uh, I think that we have this long history of being dismissed. Um, there is, um, I would claim there will be a genuine willingness um, to change if we see real movement on uh, enlargement of the European Union to include Ukraine. Um, there are a lot of fears there, a hawkish central and Eastern Europe or Northern Bloc that I think uh, Western Europe is afraid of. Loss of, loss of voting power with, um, within the EU, loss of funds for CAP and structural funds. So I think these are changes that um, we will have to, we will uh, we'll see to determine whether or not it really is a Zeitenwende. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. President. We will come back in a second to, to Euro, but before we speak about the European Zeitenwende, I would like to zoom out a little bit to the larger world and look at the shifts in the power relations and in the, in the global order, which is, um, unfolding under our eyes and, and perhaps ask Bruno who has been um, following these developments very closely over the last um, years if not uh, decades uh, about you know the main actors in uh, in this in this battle because it is obvious that China is, is the key challenger of, of the Western domination in the world and most recently, Putin, Xi Jinping, they refused to participate in the G20 meeting, which one may say it's a, a symbol or a sign of, of their rejection of, of the multilateral arrangements of the era, which uh, is slowly but steadily coming to, to a close. And a few weeks ago, the six new countries joined BRICS, um, a club grouping considered to be one of the Chinese instrument to challenge the US. And so I, my, my uh, question to you, Bruno, is uh, has China been able to take advantage of the global repercussions uh, provoked by the Russian aggression and further cement its influence in the world? And uh, are we maybe doomed to live in a world shaped by the rivalry of the two superpowers? Or will you see alternative to this scenario? Well, I think it's been a an ambiguous period for China. Uh, there are some elements that show China is increasing its presence, its influence in the global economy. The story about electrical vehicles is really quite dramatic. At the beginning of the pandemic, China was the fifth largest auto exporter in the world. And now, believe it or not, to 2023, it will be the largest, overtaking Japan after having overtaken Germany, South Korea, and the US. Uh, on the other hand, very difficult transition from an economic model that no longer works. I think Chinese authorities are aware that it no longer works, but it's very difficult to change. Uh, a lot of pressure coming from the US that they feel, uh, closing off markets that are necessary for this economic transition. Xi Jinping has used that expression, changes that have not happened in 100 years, many times. So it wasn't directed specially at Putin, he's used it over the past five years in many, many speeches. Uh, what does he mean by it? Um, it? It's an interesting sentence because, of course, over the past hundred years, there have been many dramatic historical events of enormous significance. 
not the least uh, World War II, of course, not the least the rise of, of the Chinese Communist Party. But I think what he means is something different, that the structure of the global order has been perhaps uh, roughly the same for 100 years in the sense that the American-led order started at the end of World War I. And I think that's what Xi Jinping means, that the American-led order. Chinese uh, speeches, texts, particularly Xi Jinping's speeches and texts are almost always about the US, even though he doesn't use the, the name so often. So he thinks, believes that the American-led order is coming to an end and something else will replace it. Uh, obviously, when he talks to Putin, it's, uh, it's very tempting for him to say, the two of us are, are doing this together, uh, the two main actors bringing the American-led order to an end. But I think the, the war, you know, there's a disagreement between people who think the war has been great for China uh, particularly some uh, conservatives in the U.S. that think China is using this as a way to distract the U.S. from Taiwan. I don't agree with that. My impression, very strong impression, is that China is not very happy uh, with the course things have taken. It's made China's uh, politics towards Europe very difficult. It was already difficult to try to navigate a middle path between Russia and Europe. China wants to keep both uh, roughly on board. And the war made it practically impossible. It's forced upon China the necessity to choose more and more between Europe and Russia, which is something they would not like to do. Uh, but um, to conclude, I think it's important that Europe continues to have, uh, I would say, disagreements with the US on China are positive overall. I think we should try to moderate some of the impulses in Washington on China policy. I know there's disagreement on this, and, and perhaps more importantly, I think the main reason China has not gone full board on supporting Russia in Ukraine has been Europe's position, right? that China does not want to lose Europe, and that has refrained its natural instinct to support Russia. I was just in New York in a conference with some people who have access to the classified intelligence about what China exactly is doing, uh, and they, they told me that even though there's been some elements of soft support, it's clear to them, looking at that intelligence, that China could be doing a lot, lot more to support Russia, and it's not doing it. It's worth asking why not. And again, in my opinion, it, it's because of Europe's position. And the ambiguity that Europe has cultivated, I think it's constructive, and we should continue cultivating it leaving the options open. I think if we join the US in a pure confrontational policy, China will not hesitate for a moment and will join, join Russia on the, other, on the other side and we'll be back in, in, the, in the hottest periods of the Cold War. Yeah, thank you, Bruno, and I will come back to this question of ambiguity in Europe's um, approach to this um, rivalry between the US and China, but before doing that, I, I would like to ask Mark another a different question, because we, we talk a lot about the rise of China, but there's also a rise of other big players or middle-sized uh, players in the, in, um, in the world, which is, I think, also a, a very important development, a sign of, of, of these new times. We sometimes refer to these countries as the global south, but it's, uh, it's perhaps not very accurate. But just to give an example, India will, will just in a few years overtake Germany and Japan when it comes to the GDP size. It's, it's already the, the largest uh, country in the world. Turkey played a very important role in brokering the grain deal, which has an more enormous importance for, for Africa, Asia, and other parts of, of, uh, of the world. The African Union is joining the G20. That might be another sim yet another symbol of, of how the, the formerly developing world is engaging in the global power struggle. So, so Mark, you, in, in an essay which you published uh, recently in Foreign Affairs, you, you wrote that China is better prepared for the emerging uh, world order better than the US, not at least because it better understands the motivations and ambitions of the countries of the global south. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit on that and tell us how this global south, uh, south countries, how they play out in this new emerging world order? Thank you very much, Piotr. Um, 
you know, I think the backdrop to this is the, the Titan vendor, the changes unseen in a century, the turning point, is essentially a description of the fact that the, the post-Cold War order is crumbling and people are trying to work out what is coming in its place. And for that reason, people are looking back at, at what came before it, because that's the most obvious place to, to look. And if you go back to the world before 1989, the world after World War II, you had two big forces that were shaping the world. One was ideological competition, the competition between the superpowers that uh, split the world into two blocks. And the other was the quest for national independence, um, which expressed itself in the end of the, the great European empires and uh, the fragmentation of, of, of the world from around 50 states in 1945 to you know, 150, 200 states within the, the decades after that. And both of those trends were, were very important parts of the world after 1945, but the dominant one was ideological competition. It was so strong that even countries that refused to choose a bloc had to define themselves by their non-alignment um, because alignment was the kind of dominant force. And often these quests for independence got co-opted by the, by the Cold War. So lots of these struggles for independence in Vietnam, in Korea, in Angola, in all sorts of different countries became proxy wars between the superpowers who were, who were dominating the world. What's very interesting about, about the current moment is that China and America are both looking at the, the end of the post-Cold War order and they're betting on different successes. The US um, thinks that we are going to go back to, to a Cold War where ideological competition is, is most important. And it realizes that as China grows and becomes more and more powerful, it doesn't want to, um, to face... Uh, China on its own, so it's therefore trying to align all of the democracies in the world to recreate the free world, because it knows that China plus Europe, sorry, that the, the US plus Europe plus uh, Japan, Korea, India, all these other democracies will be much more powerful than, than China, even if China's GDP carries on growing faster than, than US GDP. Um, China, on the other hand, um, realizes it can't win a battle of alliances against alliances. So it's, it's going for a different strategy and it's betting that the dominant force of the next few decades is going to be this quest for independence, for countries wanting to take back control. And is therefore trying to, to adopt an asymmetrical challenge to the US approach rather than building a Chinese bloc to meet the, uh, the US bloc. What it's trying to do is to pose as the friend of countries that want independence, that want control, that want to take back uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the ability to write their own stories. And that's basically uh, what its strategy is towards the global south through the Belt and Road Initiative in the past and now through these three new initiatives that have been launched, the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, um, the Global Civilization Initiative, it's basically telling other countries that, you know, we can be your partner, we can give you more options, you can still carry on doing things with the West, but we will uh, allow you to be able to play, or play different powers off against each other and have more freedom of movement. And if you look at these middle powers that, um, that Piotr was talking about, Many of these countries uh, have got very, very close relationships with the US and the US is, is trying to get them to be part of, 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 of the free world. But it's interesting if you look at Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, uh, India, what they're trying to do is, is have their cake and eat it. They want to, to have advantages of access to, to the kind of universal institutions, have a strong security relationship with the US, but they also want to maintain their economic links with, with China. And actually, you know, I, I, I love Bruno's work and I, and I agree with a lot of it, but I don't think that the reason that China is, is 
taking the position it is, is because of Europe. I think it's because actually most of the rest of the world don't want a world of blocks. They want a world where they can determine their own future. And though China's long-term goals are obviously about the decline of the US and, and the end of, of, of uh, the sort of structure that we've seen at the moment, they think that the best way that they can um, appeal to, to other parts of the world is to uh, have this sort of faux neutrality um, of supporting uh, Russia enough so that it doesn't collapse <laughs> but being able to, 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 to build up relations with, with other parts of the world. And I think that um, what we're seeing uh, increasingly is a more kind of sophisticated understanding of this in different parts of the world, and I think the US is, is starting to, to change. But I think it, it's pretty uh, uh, clear that the reason why this quest for independence is going to be more important than ideological competition is, is because in 1945, in the world after that, the Soviet Union and the US of A were both incredibly attractive ideologically to many parts of the world. They also controlled the vast amount of the global economy and, and, and had the biggest armies. And also, the world economy was divided. It was decoupled. So people didn't really have options. And therefore, they were able to discipline other countries and force them to choose. And that's why you might have had the grammar of independence, but the underlying logic was one of ideological competition. If we look at the future, I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think the rest of the world is much more powerful in terms of their economic size. Our economies are much more intertwined. And even though there's a lot of de-risking going on, we're a long way from having kind of decoupled economies. And that's going to make it much harder for China and America to force the rest of the world to choose. And I think many of these countries are going to want to have their cake and eat it, have close relationships with the, with, uh, with the US uh, in security terms, have close relationships with China in economic terms, have relationships with Europe. And, you know, the Indians uh, have put this maybe more brutally and eloquently than anyone else when they say the only alliance that, that, that we're interested in is an alliance with India's interests, and that will trump everything else. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And you'd like, from, from this, you know, very global perspective, I'd like to come to Europe. Uh, and uh, Mr. President, it was um, mentioned um, the essay uh, written by Jürgen Habermas and, and Jacques Derrida, 20 years ago. Um, and interestingly, the online magazine Vox Europe uh, has recently launched a series of, of essays to which Natalie Tocci uh, also contributed under the uh, title The Rebirth of Europe to reflect on the possibility of, of Europe's renewal in the face of, of these great challenges, both Bruno and um, uh, Mark um, uh, referred to. And uh, this title, The Rebirth of Europe, r r relates to, the, to this famous um, essay written by uh, Habermas and Derrida, and, and the, 20 years ago they believed that a new European identity could be born in the wake of European opposition to the Iraq war. And today, I think, unlike these two big intellectuals, uh, nobody in Europe believes that, that uh, it is Europe's soft power only and anti-militaristic kind of post-bellum identity which, which could be the basis of EU's influence in this very messy world. So, Natalie, it is, it's this... Uh, what we are experiencing now is this war a moment of, uh, indeed, of Europe's renewal, or, or rather perhaps a testimony to Europe's decline, uh, given the dependence on the US and military realm and, and inability to deter Russia. Well, so indeed, so, you know, going back to the, to the Habermas and Derrida uh, piece, I mean, in, in such obvious ways, yeah, um, 20 years later, it's so clear that they were wrong. I mean, in a sense, their argument was premised on essentially you know, that rebirth was premised on three main points, a European identity uh, in juxtaposition to the United States, and hence the context of the war in Iraq, uh, a European identity in which, indeed, soft power would prevail over hard, 
and although this was not as explicit, but I think, as, as Thomas was rightly saying, a European identity in which old Europe huh, would, uh, would, would prevail. And, and very clearly, 20 years later, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, all three of those things, right, have been completely wiped off, uh, off the map. But this still sort of raises the question, so um, if that was not the rebirth that we, you know, that we were really talking about, is there a rebirth of Europe now? And, and if it is a rebirth, what is it made of? Um, what's the content of it? So I think, you know, here we are over a year and a half into this uh, invasion, and um, I think that part of that rebirth is there, and it's made of a greater unity, a far greater unity within Europe than what many of us expected. I mean, I remember when ECFR came out with a, a very interesting poll after a few months uh, of, uh, of the war, uh, I think it must have been around the summer, basically, of, uh, of last year, where basically the, the trends in public opinion were really pointing to what, what what ECFR defined as a rift between uh, a peace and a justice camp. And, and I think it's actually quite surprising that that rift actually hasn't materialized in, in policy terms. You know, here we are a year and a half later and, um, you know, sort of the 11 packages of sanctions, in a sense, are testimony to the fact that that unity is actually still there. Uh, which, as I said, you know, considering the different sensitivities, the different perspectives, the different histories, geographies, and all the rest of it, is actually really rather surprising. Which then kind of begs the question, why is it that we have managed to stick together? I personally think that a huge part of the story has to do with the fact that um, economically, and therefore energetically, we have done fantastically well. Uh, I think, you know, looking at it from my southern European perspective, uh, trust me, had we not handled uh, the energy crisis the way we did, um, that rift between a peace and a justice camp definitely would have emerged in policy terms. Partly we were lucky, partly we were good, but I think, you know, sort of, I think that is part of a rebirth in the sense of how is it that we handled the energy crisis? We only managed to handle it because we stuck together, because we used, in Jean Monnetian terms, the crisis to make a step further in our integration journey. Now, this then leads to the other point of the, uh, of the Habermas uh, Derrida uh, article, which is, you know, uh, the Europe premised on soft power as opposed to hard. And of course, in very obvious ways, uh, as you were suggesting, of course, you know, this, the, exactly the opposite, right, has, uh, has emerged over the last, uh, last year and a half. And I must say this was a trend that was already building up well before Russia's uh, large-scale invasion. Um, and here, I think, and, and perhaps I'll end with this paradox, here, I think, is the paradox of the situation that we're in. Because I think also in the defense field, we did use this crisis, war as crisis, as... Uh, an opportunity, in a sense, to make that step forward. And we've done things that, you know, sort of were unthinkable only a few years ago. I mean, you know, the fact that we're, uh, you know, the European Union is providing military assistance to a third state at war, uh, the fact that it is building a joint procurement uh, platform to procure ammunition. Um, so it has done a number of things that are, for in, you know, for Europeans, actually really rather remarkable. And yet, if you take a step back and say, well, okay, so we're doing all this, we've done all this, we'll keep on doing more. We're spending more on defense, you know, not as much as we should, but we're spending more on defense. And yet the bottom line is we're more dependent on the United States. Now today in a situation in which indeed a European identity is not juxtaposed to an American identity, you could say, well, that's not the end of the world. And yet, uh, we know that um, after Joe Biden, there will hopefully be Joe Biden, but there is one certainty, that after Joe Biden and Joe Biden, there is not Joe Biden. And whoever it is that comes after Joe Biden and Joe Biden is not gonna be Atlanticist in the way in which this president is. So I think this is a question, although we shouldn't be under, sort of looking at it in in juxtaposed terms, but I think it's a question that we're not thinking about enough today. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. That's a perfect bridge to my next question to, to President Ilves, because I think 
the real Zeitenwende which we may be facing, hopefully will not materialize, but, but we, as Matt had said, it um, should be seriously taken into account is uh, indeed a change in power in, in Washington. Um, and uh, my question to, to is very simple to President Ilves, how, how concerned should we be and uh, what should we do to prepare for, for a scenario you know, that the successor of Mr. Biden is not Mr. Biden? Well, I think we need to be very concerned, frankly, uh, given that um, it's, it's almost 100% uh, certain that uh, in his, uh, it, were he to come back, that uh, one of the first things Donald Trump would do is, uh, or th several things, is uh, pull out of NATO, uh, pull out of, or end aid to, an assistance to Ukraine, and uh, make up with Vladimir Putin. So I think that uh, that's uh, a reason enough for all of us to worry. Up till then, we can say that, as Natalie also uh, referred to, that uh, Europe, in fact, has become far more dependent upon um, the United States than, many, than anyone could have envisioned or many wanted. I mean, we can say that, bank, that basically strategic autonomy is envisioned as a naturally and obviously headed by the sole nuclear power in the EU is dead until the next, uh, until the EU elections. I mean, the, the idea, this envision, the vision of strategic autonomy is some kind of Franco-German uh, led thing that then all the rest of us would, uh, would fall in line and follow when in fact it has turned out that when it comes to security and foreign, sec foreign security policy, the laggards have been those two, um, and have, they've really only stepped up recently. Uh, and in fact, uh, the major push has come from Central Eastern and Northern Europe. Uh, so, uh, and I would argue that no matter what happens in the US election within the European Union, that uh, Central, Eastern, and Northern Europe will remain, as they have been traditionally, far more transatlantic than Carolingian Europe. Um, so I think, I would just add one more thing just on China, which is that um, I think one of the things that really needs to change is that um, uh, the current trade relations between Europe the great regulatory power, the United States, the technologically innovative power, and then, uh, well, the liberal democracies of Asia, uh, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and Oceania. Um, China has 1.3, 1.2 billion people. Some, per some percentage of those are really great in tech. The combined population of those three areas, Europe, U the US, and, and Asia, liberal democratic Asia, is about the same. If we are going to compete with China um, as, a, as liberal democracies versus uh, algorithmic authoritarianism, we're going to have to stop spending our time bashing each other engaging in industrial policy that beggars the others. Um, it's the kind of, uh, uh, basically, the, the protectionism that we saw in the 19th century now is, it takes place more or less, at least between the US and uh, Europe at a continental level. But it seems that much of the legislation coming out of both of those two countries seems to be geared towards uh, getting a leg up over the other. Europe wants to regulate the US tech area. The, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the United States is trying to pull the innovators out of Europe and into the US. And I think that's a real dead end because the, those three parts of the world that do share common liberal democratic values, not, and no single one can compete with what China will be. So anyway, I will say that um, those will be, that's even a bigger challenge than simply 
um, simply the um, issue of transatlantic relations. And the last thing I say about China is that no matter what and what China is doing, in addition to its other efforts, is that it wants to be both a tech and a natural and raw, raw natural resources superpower, which I think underlies much of their uh, activity in, um, in Africa and also in Russia. I mean, I think Russia is a complete, is going to be a vassal state um, that will be kept alive by Chinese cash in exchange for gas and oil and mineral resources. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to both Mark and, and Bruno to perhaps to react on, on what, you, what you have just said, because I think you raised a couple of extremely important points and, and, and made, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misun hopefully I didn't misunderstand it, but, but you basically said that strategic autonomy is kind of dead for now. I mean, it, it's, it's a concept driving the, the European um, um, not only foreign policy, but approach to, to, the, to the wider world, and certainly, and 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 secondly, that that we should uh, kind of, regardless of what ha what happens in the U.S., that that this idea of of a Western bloc uh, kind of um, uh, centered around certain values and liberal democracies. Uh, a strong alliance of democracies is is not dead. I mean th that this is something which needs to be revived. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether you uh, have the same perspective on that, uh, and, and how you, Mark and, and Bruno, uh, how you how you define basically Europe's place in this new world with regard to these two big superpowers. So. Uh, I think that um, Tom is, President Ilvis is, is, is absolutely right that strategic autonomy is not a concept that will unite the European Union, it can only divide the European Union. But it's also very problematic to define our entire identity as, as Derrida and Habermas did. <laughs> Um, in relation to the US when the big story of our times is about the rise of non-Western uh, powers and where a lot of our dependencies, you know, whether it's on rare earths um, from China or energy from Russia come from other players. Um, but I also think philosophically from a European perspective that the pursuit of autonomy isn't really the kind of world we want to live in. The core idea behind the EU is about the idea of interdependence. And I think we had various utopian ideas about how interdependence could, could turn enemies into friends. But the mistake um, uh, from that would be to, to kind of then pursue an agenda of, of, of thinking that we can have pure self-reliance or to, to bet on a world of blocks, because I don't think that that is what's going to emerge. I am an Atlanticist. I, would, I thank God every day that you have somebody like Joe Biden in the White House, and I would love for that relationship that we have at the moment to continue. But as, as both Natalie and President Ilvis pointed out, we can't rely on that. We need to put ourselves in a position where Ukraine can be a free and a sovereign country, whoever's in the White House, where we can look after our own security. So at ECFR, we've been trying to work up a, an alternative idea to strategic autonomy, and we call it strategic interdependence. And the basic idea is that we should be less naive about um, interdependence, not put ourselves in, in a place where we can be bullied because of our dependency on different actors, um, but at the same time, our goal shouldn't be to be autonomous and to withdraw from the world. In fact, you know, to be sovereign, to have a choice, means to have lots of dependencies. So if one country tries to blackmail and bully you, you can turn to another. And I think that's the sort of relation, that's the sort of outlet that we should have within it. And within that, we should try and, and build as strong a relationships as possible. And I think actually, as an Atlanticist, I think the transatlantic relationship would be a lot stronger if you have a strong Europe that can be a good partner to the US rather than a kind of whiny, whingy, infantilized partner that doesn't do anything and complains all the time, which is 
too often been our contribution to the transatlantic relationship. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mark and Bruno. Maybe on, on, you know the same the same question basically for you. Uh, well, you, you know, in just over a year, we can have an American president and vice president. Imagine a vice president, uh, Ramaswamy, that uh, are on the fringes of opinion uh, in Europe. Uh, that are, you know, the, the only people you can find in Europe with similar opinions would be Fidesz and Orban in Hungary. And these are the people we're going to have to deal with. Quite likely, not to say probable, because I think if you look carefully at the poll numbers, if you look carefully at the economic figures, if you look carefully at how frail Joe Biden looks right now when he's on the campaign trail, uh, you have to conclude, I, I do at least, that the Republican candidate, whoever he is, uh, is, is, is in, the, is in the, the, the top position right now, in the, in the poll position as the race starts. So we have to prepare. I think we are preparing already. I never tired of pointing out that if you look at the figures as collected by the Kiel Institute in Germany, uh, Europe, the UK and the EU together have contributed significantly more than the US uh, when it comes to support for Ukraine. Perhaps double the US. There's some discussion about the figures, whether some of the commitments the EU has made are multi-annual and the US doesn't do multi-annual commitments and so on, but it's clear that the U.S. contributed more than the U.S. So we are on the path where the U.S. is acquiring a capacity to have an independent voice. I think it's been a very good crisis for the EU, perhaps not for Europe, not for many European countries, but if you compare to crises in the past, most people, either consciously or unconsciously, are aware that this crisis, Ukraine, is different from previous ones because it's not the EU that is at fault. It's, it's, it's national countries. Uh, you know, we look to what France did, to what Germany did, to what Italy did in their relations to Russia. Uh, whereas previous crises, the Eurozone crisis, the refugee crisis, uh, it was the EU that was being blamed. It was the EU that was on the, on the front line of criticism. Not anymore. So you see this kind of development. I think it will be very necessary because um, the dynamic between the US and China is of a desperate struggle for supremacy. Uh, we're moving more and more in that direction, and things could very quickly get out of control. Um, if you listen, for example, to Kevin Rudd and his latest speeches, and I think he's a very good analyst of what is taking place, it's very possible that China will conclude that it has no possibility to occupy a uh, important place in the existing global order, that the US will block its entry into high-tech segments of the global economy, and that only an hegemonic war will allow China to redraw the rules, an hegemonic war taking place in Taiwan or elsewhere. So we're approaching those, those days where things could suddenly become very dangerous and would be complacent after Ukraine to think that can't happen in our world. And Europe has an important role to play here because for Europeans, it's more about balance than supremacy. Uh, a EU official in Brussels told me the other day that European countries, they have been the rulers of the world and they have fallen from that position and they understand that in history you go up and you go down uh, and that kind of understanding, that kind of lack of um, enthusiasm about this uh, struggle for supremacy I think is lacking in Beijing and Washington and it has to be Europeans to, uh, it's, a, it's a great task, it's a great historical task for Europeans to try to provide the balance uh, that alone can prevent uh, a military conflict between the US and China. I mean that very seriously, that, that we've reached the point where that should be on the table as a, a serious possibility for the next 10 years. Thank you, Bruno. I'm, I'm conscious about the time, but we started 15 minutes later, so I, I take the liberty of, of course, asking um, yet another question to, to Natalie. And uh, in the search for, for a Titan Vendus, <laughs> Uh, we cannot, uh, I think, leave out uh, one important turning point which may happen uh, at some point, and this is the EU enlargement. And this debate about um, the EU's absorption capacity is in full swing. The, we, we dis we're discussing how to adapt the European Union, how to change it, how to reform, and so on and so forth. So my, my question for you is very simple and short. So will this, what will this, you of 35, 36 members look like, actually? How, how different is it going to be from the EU as we know? 
Well, I, I think the, the, the premise, in a sense, to that um, question is the fact that enlargement will happen. And I think this, this is the fundamental point, yeah? I mean, for, frankly speaking, Is it le legitimate to say that I, it will happen? I, I think so. Uh, I, I think this is the main, the, the main point. I think, you know, to be honest, over the last 10 years, if one kind of takes, you know, 2013, entry of Croatia, but frankly speaking, since 2007, uh, since the completion of, uh, of the Eastern enlargement, we kind of went off enlargement. And we went off enlargement because we thought that we could afford not to do it. And, um, you know, uh, the EU doesn't actually like enlarging. You know, perhaps with the exception of the northern enlargement, small, very rich countries, but if you can avoid enlarging, which at the end of the day is a dilution of power, you avoid it. And now I think it has become crystal clear to everyone that this is something that we cannot avoid doing. And I think it's, it's, a, strategically, um, it's a strategic turning point, uh, which we really haven't lived through for a long time. And, and what's interesting about this uh, absorption uh, sort of capacity story is that whereas it was originally um, sort of coined, um, the term was coined at a time in which enlargement was, in a sense, falling off the agenda, uh, and it was used as an excuse not to enlarge, particularly, you know, the debate about Turkey, for instance. Now, I think it is used in a very, very different way. I mean, sort of, um, the debate is, yes, indeed, what do candidate countries have to do and the reforms and all the rest of it, but what is it that we have to do, given that enlargement is happening, uh, and we don't have a choice, what is it that we have to do? And there, I think, which then gets to the point of, therefore, what kind of union is it going to be? Is it going to be a fundamentally reformed EU? Probably not, or not to begin with. So, frankly speaking, I don't imagine fundamental changes in institutions or decision-making. Uh, I think the fundamental changes will have to do with policies uh, and with budgets. Uh, I think the fact that, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, Commission President von der Leyen's speech, uh, in a sense, sort of zoomed in precisely on that and saying, you know, we have to do a review of the different policies. Uh, to me, it signals the fact that there's a seriousness about this. Because, you know, the minute in which you start saying, well, in order to enlarge, you have to go to qualified majority voting. I I'm in favor, right? But this is not a showstopper for enlargement, right? Whereas other issues concerning policies are, and those are what have to be uh, addressed immediately. Thank you very much, Natalie. I have the feeling that um, this uh, panel was far too short, and we just only touched upon a few uh, important issues, but um, in a very unsatisfactory way, in a way. It's not a <laughs> criticism about the panelists, but the shortage of time. But I think, uh, I hope that this panel made you interested in other uh, items on the agenda of Freedom Games and that was, um, I think, just a, a teaser for the rest of, the, of, the, of this great event. So I wish you a great evening and great uh, two days of discussions. And thank you very much uh, to our great panelists, uh, President Thomas Hendrik Ilves, Mark Lennart, Bruno Massais, Nathalie Tocci, thank you very much. And thank you to you.